Welcome to Amusement Sparks, the theme park design show. I'm your host, Andrew Spawn, and with us today is Brent. This guy is a podcaster, game designer, and Star Trek musical writer. So, say hi, Brent. Hello. Hi. Brent Black here. Thank you for having me on. We're glad you're here. Um, You've got quite a YouTube following, and you're also a super creative guy, and we have this connection over Star Trek, and so we're here to design a Star Trek theme park. Um, I'm so ready. Dude, it's a it's a huge canon. Why why do you like Star Trek? What was your first one? Um, so definitely next gen as a kid, and I just really vaguely knew the characters. It's so episodic that you can kind of get an idea yep. just from watching one episode. But um, in around 2010, I got my first real paycheck, bought my first real TV, uh, paid for Netflix, Ooh. and at the time they had. All of the Star Trek movies, I think, like, motion picture up through, certainly up through Generations. And wow. I just made a marathon of watching, I, I wish somebody had told me not to start with the motion picture or ever <laughs> watch it, but, but I, I went all the way through to Generations, and so that got me into the TOS canon, mm-hmm. um, and so I watched a lot of Next Gen, uh... I've dipped into all of them. In fact, the one that I've watched most is Voyager, even though it's not my favorite. I don't know huh. what – it's something for me to talk about in therapy. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, writing this Wrath of Khan musical has, has led to me watching a lot of the original series just to kind of, you know, to see the difference between movie Trek and show Trek, which I think is also very applicable to Next Generation where you've got angry, <laughs> angry violent – movie Picard versus like never speaks above a whisper Shakespearean TV Picard. So, yep. um, and if, I guess if you're, if your viewers and listeners aren't familiar with Star Trek, this is all gobba to you. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so. hopefully they are, at least this could yeah. be a good primer, a good introduction. And you can yeah. see how, how much passion the series can give someone. Absolutely. So the Wrath of Khan musical, how did that all get started? I know you have a kind of a background in music and you write a lot of lyrics for things. Yeah, so in 2015, I was feeling myself getting burnt out on my YouTube channel, which was all about video game music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, burnout was, I was a little bit ahead of, I started earlier, I should say, than a lot of the YouTubers um, that are now big. And so by the the time burnout was becoming a thing people talked about publicly, Uh I had already had it. and, And I was like, oh, that's a thing? I just thought I was a bad person. I wish this had been a thing when I was going through it. But, um... You know, I, I was starting. To, I was starting to look to branch out. I started being on a podcast with a friend of mine, and I, I just, I liked a girl named Lisa. She's a dancer. I went to a <laughs> show that was an interpretive dance show. Uh, it's not my thing. But at one point, these guys came out in spacesuits, and they reminded me of Chekhov and Terrell in on the the desert planet in Wrath of Khan, and I just sat there going. A Wrath of Khan musical would be <laughs> such a deliciously bad idea that it could be really <laughs> funny. Because um, it's so not right for musical theater. Right. But I tinkered, 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 tinkered with it. And then I just had this big opening in between uh, different chapters of my weird pinball career last July. And um, just started writing it full speed. And now I'm on the third complete draft. So that's the story. Wow, that is so exciting. I'm I'm stoked about that. I do. I think Thanks. there's kind of a connection between this is a little bit of a bad word, I guess, but sort of campy B movie type things with like low budget theater. But because there's mm-hmm. certain there's a beauty within that, like the kind of oh, I don't know, yes, lovableness. You're absolutely of, right. Like an Ed Wood movie, for example. It's like I see what you're going for. There's some purity there, but then I know that you kind of had to cut corners and had to make it a real thing. But at least people get to enjoy it in real life now. Um, yeah, well, and I mean, Little Shop of Horrors is very much in that vein. The original yes. movie was so, like, made in 48 hours and had all these <laughs> plot holes and was very flawed. But sometimes a flawed movie, if you turn it on its head and make it a comedy, can be some of the best musicals. So yes. this is an example of that. Even though Wrath of Khan is great, let's be real. It's a fairly low-budget Star Trek movie. It's not exactly Citizen Kane. Right. <laughs> Well said. But yeah, bringing, bringing a, a pinch of, of comedy and a dash of music makes anything better in general. But yeah, I'm so excited about that. It sounds awesome. 
Um, but for today, for the theme park, I think it might be too hard to do the entire Star trek averse. So you want to mm. stick with TNG for our theme park? Is that what you want to go for? Well, for my, my question would be, the thing is that to me, because I'm so steeped in TOS, and I would say with the, with the major motion pictures lately, I think that most people are more familiar. Actually, that's, it's, it's hard okay, to say. Okay. Yeah, I know it, that TNG it? is having a moment, too. Like, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of podcasts I'm hearing, people are going back and rewatching it. And it well, is what if really we, good. What if, once it gets what if we, oh, it's amazing. What if we yeah. could, what if we could do a hybrid of mm-hmm. TNG is the, is like the main thing, but uh-huh. just kind of like Disney World has their new stuff like Pixar, but you still yeah. have Goofy and Mickey walking around. Maybe like uh, a little I bit like of that. both and we won't, we won't worry about uh, Enterprise or DS9. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm fine okay. with that. That sounds cool. So, I mean... There's some similarities between the two anyway, especially if you approach it from like a a theme park design perspective, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, we need to allow a lot of people to explore this space at the same time. So it kind of gets the sort of MMO feeling instead of it being like, you know, a single player game. It's like you got to kind of design this for a lot of people to go at once. Yes, absolutely. Um, But yeah, I feel like spaceships and planets are kind of the main locations, but I know that's super gigantic, and obviously there's a lot of planets that we can visit. But do you want to start with the spaceship itself, or what are your first things that are popping to mind for you? So I, in real life, love theme parks. Cool. Um, I lived, I grew up very close to Six Flags Over Texas, which was the first Six Flags. Ooh. Um, Very quick detour. Do you know why it's called Six Flags? Um, No. Because six, six, six different flags have flown over Texan soil. So wow. it started as a park with um, the Confederacy, what? Republic of Texas, United States, France, Spain, and Mexico. Those were the areas. And then wow. it became, now it's Looney Tunes and DC Comics land. But right. I love that factoid because a lot of I people I had no know. idea. Yeah. Um, so was there originally like a Confederacy land and like yeah, Spain land? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And now it's more like Wild West because uh-huh. the Confederacy land, it doesn't, you don't want it to be like, yeah, this is the area of the park where we really love slaves, you know, the like. The South will not... rise again, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, um, that was the concept. And Holy it, crap. you know, it, it has, it just was a franchise name they kept going with. But and you're asking me about initial ideas. Yeah. I think that because there are moments from the entire franchise where, the, the ship goes fast like I love roller coasters mm-hmm. and I love roller coaster simulators there's this battle that is um, that connects Star Trek The Next Generation with Deep Space Nine and it's like the big deal in uh, the best of both worlds which is this two parter where Picard becomes a Borg um, which I'm going to try to explain as I go along for people in the audience like he basically gets assimilated by this robot culture that like makes you one of them and now you're you know you're you lose your individuality and there's this huge battle where all these different ships in the federation this huge fleet they're all trying to just mess up this big cubic shaped borg ship and not doing great but they're just flying around and it's madness and they've yeah. got to probably dodge and weave around all the other ships so they're not bumping into their buddies and messing up their ship so I feel like something on the order of a space mountain, like an indoor, cool. very special effecty. You're flying through space, and oh, we're gonna hit the Reliant, or oh, we're gonna hit the Defiant, or whatever other oh. ships rhyme. Um, but like <laughs> going in a loop, and like maybe even you're not on the Enterprise, but you keep hearing people that you know. Like you, yes. you hear like Worf. It's like this is this is Lieutenant Commander Worf on the Reliant or the Defiant. I'm sorry, that's. Oh my gosh! On the Defiant, pull up, pull up! You're gonna, you're gonna impact with us, you know. We and then, and then Worf does his thing where he's like, "We must attempt ramming speed," and you're like, "Oh, we're gonna fly into you!" Ah, like you know, um, Dude. just really interactive. Still a moving coaster, mm-hmm. but indoors enough where you could really create the illusion of being in space. Uh, show the Borg ship and have it really feel like we are in, su- like. We are in a ship that's moving so fast the gravity controls are failing. And, right. uh, you know, um, 
that kind of thing. Maybe even like there's phaser buttons that light up on the on the car that you're uh-huh. in. So that when it's like fire all phasers and the lights, you know, show up and you could find some way to make it look like your phasers are actually sending out, you know, beams of light toward right. what's going on just to kind of make it like the Star Trek experience. You know, That would totally work. And this is almost a, a Star Wars ish moment, like, a, you know, dog mm-hmm. fighting you don't usually think of with Star Trek. But in th- those two episodes or I guess that one battle for sure. Yeah, and it's I'll, one of the also, few that does <laughs> real that. action-y ones, yeah. I love the idea, though. You could do one track that's, like, spirally or whatever inside. Possibly each train is its own ship, and they're, like, yeah. well-lit from the outside. So as you're flying around, you see the people who are in line behind you, and they're on a different ship. So that way you can have a lot of yeah. ships flying around um, while still getting a lot of people through. But then also have some that are stationary, and they just feel like they're moving because you're rushing past them. Gold star, man. That That's an amazing start, I think. Launching it off with some action and with uh, the phaser thing. I've never thought to combine like a shooting arcade game kind of experience with an actual roller coaster, but that's genius. It'd be so fun, especially if it's, it's connected with a story. You know, they give you cues for this is the time when it's appropriate to fire. <laughs> You're not going to shoot right. a friendly ship or whatever, but that is genius. I love that. Um, do we want to come up with like a canon explanation for who the park guest is walking through there, or are they just kind of a visitor? My thought would be, so like when I think of the Star Trek video games that have done well, a lot of the times it's doing the video game trope of you're sort of a an empty vessel character mm-hmm. that is just specific enough that you feel like you can step into it. Right. So it's like if you are the crew of the starship, I mean, who knows, the starship Gandhi, you know, the starship Marie <laughs> Antoinette, whatever it is. But, like, it's one that probably was one of the ones. It's a galaxy <laughs> class. It's a Constitution class, Starship, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but, like, if the people in the cars are the crew, um, depending on how complicated you wanted it to get, you know, right. like, it could be, like, the front is the captain's chair and it looks different and everybody wants to be. Maybe, like, the front car is just one person instead of two Ooh. and it looks kind of more like the captain's chair. That'd be awesome. Um, it's got a swivel to and, it, maybe. Yeah, and you've got like a big long. Well, boy, you wouldn't Seems want too dangerous. much. <laughs> just like teacups on a on a roller coaster. Um, just the one in the front. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like uh. that being said, so many moments in Star Trek, one of the signature things is that for whatever reason, the the battle bridge uh, can be impacted in such a way that sparks fly out of it and people, you know, fly out of things. So. <laughs> If you had, like, a little bit of that Universal King Kong ride stuff where, like, when when the thing gets impacted, you somehow feel a vibration and sparks safely fly out of somewhere near you. So cool. it really feels like, you know, uh, you're on red alert and maybe even you hear, like, your engineer going, oh, we lost we lost the warp nacelle and we got to whatever it is, you know, yeah. just to kind of make it fun and, and unique, but also feel like y- you're ship is part of that battle you remember mm-hmm. but maybe not your picard your you know wharf kind of thing that's awesome um there is this game i think it's a pc game like a fan game that requires a bunch of people each having their own laptop to play and each person takes a different role that just mm-hmm. kind of reminded me maybe we could do this something similar in its own attraction like maybe some sort of exam or or an actual simulation like you know pretend like you're fighting some bad guys or whatever, but where each person has their own pivotal role, like, you know, you've got the engineer, mm-hmm. you have the captain, because um, it's such an ensemble show, you know, there's so many important yeah. roles as far as the functioning of the ship, and no one can do it by themselves, um, where each person gets different data on their little readout on their monitor, and mm-hmm. you have to communicate that, you know, quickly and efficiently while yelling over other people, and everyone's trying to prioritize their, their information, and the captain has to take all that in and decide what to do going forward. So I think that'd be such a fun thing if you got to kind of, like you said, get into a specific role that's empty enough, but you still have jobs that you have to do and you alone can do within your little party of five or whatever. Um, I just feel like that'd be such a cool experience. I don't know specifically what theming it would be, but it'd be really neat to have to step into specific shoes instead of just a generic, you know, Starfleet person. Absolutely. Are you familiar with the Kobayashi Maru? Yes. That's what I was picturing for this. Yeah. Yeah, for our, for listeners, the Kobayashi Maru is a 
it's sort of a simulation, the way that you do a flight simulator, but it's like with the whole ship. And the student in the Kobayashi Maru is the captain. And what the student doesn't always know is that it's an, it's a completely unwinnable scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are various ways, you know, it's theorized in canon and beta canon that there are ways to get around it. And obviously Captain Kirk, when he was a student, reprogrammed it to win. But like, I think, you know, I hear all about the wizarding world of Harry Potter, where you go into a room and have an actor... Uh, really, you know, using special effects to show you how the wands work. To me, like, the idea that even if it was just, like, five minutes per person, Mm -hmm. maybe it's an extra money attraction or you have to, like, get a reservation, but if all the other crew are trained actors that do this every day... Wow. ...and they're prompting you, like, here's what's going on, what are you going to do, pick left or right, and, like, maybe they could even say, if you want to do this, you know, press this button, if you want to do that, press that button, and, like, you're not having to necessarily be like know all the terms you just make a choice based on the left or right uh, mm-hmm. arm of your chair right. and maybe there is a way to beat it um especially you know it reminds me of things like um sleep no more in new york where people that have gone a lot they kind of know the tricks they know the the, right. the, the things that you might not know you know it could spread around like people could google like how to beat the kobayashi maru at star trek world or whatever that sounds really fun, though. Like, maybe there's no true ending, but you can get to different paths. Like, it's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure story. Like, you know, oh, how did yeah. you lose this game? Oh, yeah. here's how I lost. Um, but, yeah, it's still a, a cool experience and a cool, like, examination of what it takes to be a captain. Because, yeah. you know, it's not just kissing people and being the cool guy. You know, there's a lot, a lot right. of work that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. Presumably. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, so those would be two sort of cockpit or uh you know what's the right word for that cockpit sounds um, so wrong the, i would say the bridge the bridge sure yeah. bridge simulation type experiences or um right but what else do you think we should include here other than well it's kind of a nice layout i think because we have spaceships and planets and that mm-hmm. is an obvious means of conveyance right if you want to go from right. one ship to another ship or to a planet there can be little shuttles that take you there um yes. The one thing that might be weird is you don't really do a lot of walking necessarily, which that's kind of one of the issues with space. I mean, look how Wally turned out. Um, that right. feature. <laughs> but yeah. um, taking little shuttles would be thematic and make sense. And then you can walk around once you're on the surface of a planet. Sure. Um, and it, as long as we're doing planets. Um, yeah. So there's Risa, which uh, was mentioned a lot in Next Gen, which is the pleasure planet. It's yeah. sort of like... You know, perhaps where adults would go to, on the one hand, you know, have a drink on the beach and get a massage and perhaps, perhaps meet, you know, I imagine there are substances and things one might pay money to do that could be uh, part of a pleasure planet. But like in the same way that Disney for a while had Pleasure Island, which was an adults only area Mm -hmm. late night. It could sort of be that you could have a simulated beach. You could have people, you know alien actors bring you Mai Tais or like um, even like Romulan ale and uh, Al- Al- Aldarian whiskey. I might have said that wrong, but like themed drinks. Yeah. You could even have, um, this is Deep Space Nine, but Quark, the character in Deep Space Nine, has a bar that he runs. I don't think you could have any Star Trek theme park without a Quark's bar where yeah. they serve, um, you know, just the, just the drinks we all remember, the special... Uh, things from the whole series, you know, he just, right. and also root beer, which is weirdly a thing they talk about <laughs> in Quark's bar. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. There's all kinds of, of sort of sci-fi things you can do. Like, even if mm-hmm. some of them are, are fudged a little bit or made up a little bit or pulled from some novel somewhere, sure, like sure. extended universe stuff, you can still make a full menu of really cool, exotic, alien food and beverages. Like, that sounds yeah. awesome. And there yeah. are a lot of humans, so it's not going to be weird if the bar is filled with humans and only the employees are, you know, non-human entities. But I think that's fine. I think that yeah. is appropriate for what you usually see on screen. But that sounds really cool. It'd be neat to be able to walk around. And and I do think the average Star Trek fan is probably older than the average Star Wars fan, for example. Like, yeah. I feel like it tends to skew a little higher. So doing those more adults-only experiences, I think, would be fine. I, the kids will have plenty of things they can go do while everyone else goes to, yeah. you know, the pleasure planet or whatever. That sounds awesome. Wow. Um, it'd also be neat if you did some planets that were sort of a, 
almost like a role playing session. Like you know, a lot of the nature of an episodic series like this, it's like the story kind of has to wrap up relatively quickly. You can mm-hmm. still have a good sci fi story, make people think, and bring in some interesting elements, but it needs to resolve relatively quickly. So you could do right. almost like an escape room type of experience. You know, like the episode's almost over; you only have ten minutes to solve the issue or whatever. Yeah. But go to a new planet, explore around find the problem or you know the conflict and then find a solution for it and then move on to the next attraction like right can be its own self-contained story yeah when you talk about a an escape room my first thought is there's an episode of the original series called spock's brain and the thing is that like that's a dumb one where his brain is removed and they have to like get it back but if the escape room was an abstract escape room called spock's brain and what you really had to do was think like a vulcan you had to, like, mm. you're trapped in Spock's consciousness in his katra, like his soul, wow. brain, and grams. And the only way to get out of the room is to think in this utilitarian Vulcan way, even though it's constantly fighting with you because he's a human trying right. to be very Vulcan. And yeah. so every time you make a human choice, um, and it could be interactive where you hear, you know, somebody playing Spock or the voice of Spock's mother, the voice of Spock's father, all these Ooh. things that are telling you, no, you know, that's your human side. Think about think about logic, Spock, you know, and like you're or whoever you are and you're trying to like and this is very abstract. I don't know how you'd practically do it, um, but I feel like that could be a fun way to have an escape room thing that isn't that is more theme based than yeah. like. Um, than fulfilling something that would actually happen physically on a Star Trek show. That is super cool. I just I love I love escape rooms in general, but going with a more abstract sci-fi method is that's a genius. I feel like that could be a total trend in the future of of escape rooms, making it more in your head and less about you know how did you turn the dial or whatever. That's right. genius. Go, and going I got goosebumps, going against dude. Your... Oh, well, thanks. talking I, about I, the uh... the conflict between the the human and the Vulcan. I get that. That's an issue, you know, my wife and I go back and forth. I'm a lot more Vulcan, she's a lot more human. So that balance is something I'm I'm very, you know, connected to and I understand the difficulties of leaning too far either direction. So there's right. a lot of cool puzzles you could solve that way too. You know, where a Vulcan is playing by the rules and then the human side is, is like uh Kirk a little bit, just kind of smashing down walls and, you know, doing whatever he has to do to, to win, you know, reprogramming the Kobayashi Maru, for example. I think the whole Vulcan thing is utilitarianism. Like, for instance, if you ask a Vulcan, hey, would you save one toddler or kill five adults? And you have to pick one. Yeah. Vulcan would say the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The toddler has to go. But mm-hmm. there could be puzzles that force you to think about real people and what to do with them. And, uh, you know, like that is such a key part of Spock's philosophy and the Vulcan idea and it's like your human side is going to be like oh my god well you know save the puppy or whatever it is like save the cute little triple and it's like (laughs) no that's not how it works when when you're a Vulcan you know what I mean like and by having to go against all your regular instincts because everyone playing it would ostensibly be human um, sort of stuff (laughs) like that yeah Yeah. Um, I would hope but it'd be really cool if this was like an experience for six people and if you choose the kill five adults the other five adults just drop out of the room it's like wait yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> like, at a theme park you could have so many more interactive elements where you're in there with actors and they're unable to help you or break character but like they become props in the whole thing you know and that that could even make it a little bit more organic possibly giving you more options without making them all available at once right. in other words once you've kind of chosen you're going to solve this like a vulcan you only need access to the vulcan puzzles you only need those trap doors to open or whatever and the right. the actors could be a part of that they could say if you know the player does this then i'm going to say oh look what i found here you go yeah um yeah. if they don't do that i won't i'll keep it hidden um but wow that's genius i love that um and that really works i mean similar to the kobayashi maru like kind of a mental um exploration of what are you capable of I really like that. Yeah. It's 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 peaceful, um, but it's about finding the best in people. I think that's that makes sense. I feel like that would right. be very Star Trek, you know? Yeah. And we, I, yeah, go ahead. So I just am kind of running through my brain of, like, the most fun I've had at theme parks. I've done Universal, Disney, lots of Six Flags, Busch Gardens, and there's always a show. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of live show, and sometimes they can be so crummy. 
Yes, um, usually. Like summer shows at Six Flags where they're just doing like a musical review of 1960s oldies. And it's like, yeah, this is a thing to watch while I eat my nachos, but like, <laughs> I wouldn't pay to see it. But like at Universal, you've got like the Batman stunt show, the mm -hmm. Beetlejuice, like Halloween uh, musical spectacular. There's the Indiana Jones stunt show at Disney. And I'm sitting here thinking, what if it was called like, um, you know, the stunt show Tractacular? And like they could it could have its own little story like, oh, the the portal of time, whatever's in the city on the edge of forever, which is a classic episode that like can make weird things happen and make different time periods or whatever thing you'd have to do to make it uh -huh. where our favorite characters from different series are now you know, meeting up and going, oh, what do we do? The And, like, new villain. Villains, like, trying to kill them all so the Federation never succeeds. And so these characters that are normally not working together and not having to fight are now, like, in battle. There's some Klingon Batleth battles. There's, um, you know, like, uh, an e explosions. And just like, you know, when you go and see this uh, movie special effects demonstration thing at Universal or Disney, mm -hmm. Um, but like it could be just a few, like you'd have your Picard, your Kirk, maybe your Spock, maybe your war for data. And then like, you know, your generic Klingon, your generic Andorian, whatever it is, maybe just some actual humans, who knows? Um, but, um, it could be really fun in the way that the Batman stunt show is fun. It's just trek and it could be a little bit less cerebral than some of the stuff we're talking about yeah and more just like come in here it's a hot day sit in the air conditioning and watch this 45 minute show that's going to be really exciting visually and your kids are going to love it that kind of thing that sounds awesome i also like the idea that there's a ton of humans here but we still have those few you know stars that we're hoping to see and interact with like right. you know kirk and spock for example It'd be really interesting if uh, we try to keep it as realistic as possible. You know, the actor mm -hmm. who plays Picard is during this stunt show. He pretty much only does that stunt show. Like, that's his job. But there might be a yeah. different person playing Picard in a different part of the park. That's, right. I don't know, maybe a reenactment of a specific episode or whatever. You could yeah. time it so that there's no two Picards on display at the same time anywhere. So then in canon, he's just having the craziest day of his life where he was you know, doing this, we would consider it a reenactment, but basically a live version of an episode that we saw. And then he gets warped off to this, you know, mashup big battle situation, and then yeah. he's warped off somewhere else. Um, so he's just having the craziest day, and we might get to see him a few times, but it's the same guy. It's not like we're we're saying there's, there's three Mickeys in the same room. That'd be really weird. Right. But um, yeah, I think that sounds really fun. I love the idea of doing a stunt show, something more for the kids. Um, but you could even do a musical review if you wanted to, you know, have oh, oh, you bet. <laughs> Picard with you the flute. Bet. Yeah, well, I mean, I think TNG that has so many really... concerts. Oh, dude, if they ever make this, I am going to just send them every email going, hey, hey, I've already done this. Not that I want you to use mine. Please let me write a spec thing. Let me try. Um, I just had an idea that I don't know where it would go. But like, so as we know. Um, real holograms. Oh, no, it would basically be a holodeck program, uh -huh. but it would be pared down and it would just use the kind of holograms that when they take a a, a, a star who's passed away and they mm -hmm. do a, or, or even like um, that Japanese cartoon woman hologram that tours around. Yes. Um, and looks very real. Uh -huh. Here's a thing that just came to my head, but in the final spoiler alert, in the in the final Next Generation movie, Data sacrifices himself and ostensibly dies. But because he's an android, you could ostensibly have saved an earlier version of his brain. Totally. And if you could, you know, they have all these deep fakes these days. There's like technology that could make it where if you just recorded enough of Brent Spiner's voice, then you could type in text and it would more or less be something that could communicate with you. So mm -hmm. either you could have an AI that can talk to you or you can have something where it's a hologram that an actor is typing nearby with a microphone. Yeah. And if you ask it a question, it sort of does the Siri thing where it'll talk to you, but you're talking cool. to sort of the, the 
brain engram like the positronic ghost of data. <laughs> Um, and what kind of attraction wow. it would be, I don't know. Maybe it's the kind of thing that, like, in a, when one of the restaurants, you can just go up and talk to him and then go back to your seat kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that just feels like such a Star Trek thing to me. And it sounds really fun. Like, I don't know if you would, like, ask him for advice or – because it could just be sort of, like I, – I don't know. He's such a fascinating character. Of just his delivery of lines, I think, is really good. Yeah. Initially, I was thinking of – I was picturing it as almost like one of those fortune-telling things, like, from the movie Big. Like – Mm-hmm. Zoltan or whatever, like go <laughs> yeah. up, go up and ask this thing something, but you know have it be more human and it doesn't have to be telling your fortune. That's not a very Star Trek thing, but yeah. you know, a magic eight ball type of stuff <laughs> could be kind of yeah. fun. And I I love the idea of of a character being able to interact with you in especially that situation where it would be a hologram. That'd be so cool. It's such cool technology. It's yeah, like, and we're we're getting closer and closer to the stuff they kind of had on the show that they thought yeah. would be two hundred years in the future, but it's <laughs> probably going to be sooner. Right? Oh, that'd be really cool. Because I I know that is really a cool thing. Like when it's a low, you know, like kind of a crappy animatronic, it's still pretty interesting if you're if it's your first time seeing it. But doing right. it a little bit more cutting edge is really cool. Like I know in the '90s, Nintendo would have like a 3D Mario head, and then just a guy standing behind it just talking yes. to you because he can see you like it's yes. such a cool idea and it would have been fascinating at the time it's that that same concept um for now and like for an ongoing audience you know they can come by exactly. every day and ask a different question and get a different answer like how cool right awesome. and depending on the technology used you could have an actor with a mocap uh a mocap suit or a mocap you know face dots <laughs> right who's just sitting there and doing it and it might not sound exactly like our data but it's also his 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 copy so um now i'm starting to think about uh themed restaurants because you yeah. know like especially in like epcot center and really all through most uh people gotta eat i mean it, it's more of a disney thing i think that i feel like you find less true sit down restaurants in like a uh six flag setting right but if this is a park they intend you to come to you know come visit this park resort for a day or two don't just uh-huh. come on one day um and it's a classy place too. You know, there's room for, you know, a piano concert. You know, there's there's room yes. for some some more fine dining than just wanting a cotton candy and a hot dog. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so I'm immediately thinking of some way to to have something that feels original, like you've never seen this, even though it uses elements you have seen, like mm-hmm. in um, real life on Earth, 2019, we have fusion. <laughs> We have Asian fusion. Sure. What if it was Klingon Romulan fusion? Oh, and so yes. you can have a Klingon blood wine if you want. You can have a <laughs> Romulan ale, but you can also have like some weird Romulan food and gach, which is this nasty uh, Klingon food. And it's all made up, but just like Disney, it's convincingly either kind of gross looking, but it tastes delicious or, and all the waiters can tell you like, well, it is made from the innards of a, like, you know, but like it tastes, it tastes just like, like strawberry. ham and cheese. Yeah. And like, it will really be a ham and cheese, but like that kind That's of thing. Genius. Um, I love but that. Like Klingon Romulan fusion feels like a really like it's hip. It's almost mm-hmm. like, you know, um, <laughs> the, the, the various, you know, or even, you know, 10 forward, is this famous bar and lounge on the USS Enterprise. And if you could find a way to, like, you know, when you go into this place, it's a portal into 10 Forward, and you've got Guinan, a Guinan actor that is, in fact, the bartender. There could be only five drinks available, and they're replicated like an automat yeah. where you just pull them out of the thing because they're always ready. Totally. Um, and you just have to wall really off the kitchen. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's five different house yeah. drinks you can get. And um, Guinan's just sitting there, you know, probably with a bunch of barbacks. But, like, you could sit there and talk to Guinan for a second if you want to. Like, just that kind of How cool. really cool, interactive, Disney-style um, characters, you know? I love that. And there, there is such a rich cultural tapestry, like, uh, to pull food and to pull, you know, cuisine and drinks and, and everything from. Language, yeah. like, I think that'd be another interesting thing is just hearing people speak other languages that are not from our reality. Like, how cool would yeah. that be? It's like, I'm actually in Star Trek. Man. What if what if um, a Klingon lounge singer came out for one song every half hour, but yes. he did, like, 
Frank Sinatra standards <laughs> in Klingon. That'd be translated. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I was thinking with Klingon, it might be fun to do, like, because people, there are humans who can supposedly understand and speak Klingon. If there was, yes. like, a challenge, like, you know, like a trivia question that was written in Klingon, and if you get the answer right and you can answer it in Klingon, you get, you know, the shiny prize. Like, totally. that kind of or, stuff. Or if, like, parts of the menu are written in Klingon, they have little jokes that you don't get otherwise. Like little yeah. jokes like, um, you know, don't expect, don't expect, uh, or like something like an asterisk that says, warning, there may be a few Klingon bloodworms uh, mixed in. Don't worry, it's good for you. You know, that, that, that kind that of sort thing. of, yeah. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I really like that a lot. Or even if you only speak English, but you've seen every episode of The Next Generation and the original series, there might be some parts where you would know uh, the correct response to like a specific question or like um, basically if, if you if you're very familiar with the original works, there are certain references mm-hmm. that you would understand that would be like either funny for you or if you reply with the correct answer, you get some additional experience. Yeah. I think yeah. that'd be really cool. Just something for for the fans who aren't absolutely crazy, insane fans about it, like where they speak Klingon and can read it. but um, yeah, I mean something for the fans, of course would be. Right, awesome. the kind of thing where it's fun for everyone, but if you, the more you know, the more you get small, fun rewards yes. out of jokes and references that will just tickle you and delight you if you, if you get it. Because I feel like you'd go here the first time, even if you've never seen anything from Star Trek, and then you'd want to go home and like watch all the films like you did, or right. all the even-numbered films, or whatever. Um, right. But then you want to come back after that. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm more in the culture now. This is, these are my people. Um, yeah. Or, you know, these are my creatures um i don't know the correct yeah, term yeah I'm trying to be pc here hmm. it's um. tough when there's you know all these species <laughs> well, one thing on that note that i'm thinking of like things that are more fun or less fun for fans that are more or less intense is um there are now probably 300 people who actively can appear at a convention because they've been on a star trek show yes and draw a crowd and so to it's me it's like people. If one week there's an availability for three hours a day to take a picture with or get an autograph with one of the actors that you remember from the show. And so it's roping in a little bit of that Star Trek convention element Mm -hmm. within the theme park, but it's completely on brand. It's a Um, great place to host those conventions, too. Oh, my god. We need a convention center. Yeah. 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 If you had an arcade... Um, obviously you could have just like any theme park, you could have your Pac-Mans, you could have your, um, racing games, whatever. But if some of them were themed, um, and I'm thinking about how every ship has a doctor and I'm thinking about how so often in the show, or at least multiple times through the franchise, one of the problems is the doctor only knows so many creatures anatomies. Mm -hmm. And so you could have a funny, like. Klingon operation where it's like <laughs> this open chested Klingon that kind of looks like the operation guy yeah. and you've got to use your um like laser stick it would be like on a on a rope but you've got to use your like laser healer thing to like get his second spleen okay we got that <laughs> we didn't go outside of the thing and get his uh, oh you got it wrong or That's or like great. um you know ways you could I'm thinking of ways you could do air hockey that would be um Just little changes, like, do the mallets look like Star Trek ships? Totally. What does the puck look like? Or, um, you know, uh, just little things that are not exactly a full arcade game, like a a cabinet with a game inside of it. Yeah. Um, Though, you could have arcade ports of the of the Star Trek games throughout history. There's a Voyager yeah. one where you're like the security team so they could make a first person shooter out of yep. Voyager. Um or just like the Super Nintendo ones that, you know, like uh are pretty basic but you could like use a joystick and and uh enjoy it that way. Um I like Rock'em the idea Sock'em of robots, but it's like Kirk and the Gorn. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a classic fight scene in uh mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure all the stunt choreographers are studying that scene closely as they uh, progress in their oh. careers. Oh, but... yes. It's uh, the Bible of stunt <laughs> choreography. I mean, we could theme it as an arcade, but we could also theme it as, like, the training academy. Like, um, you know, it's what your, your, like, entrance to see if you want to go to medical school or whatever in this in this universe right. would be how well do you know the anatomy of 
and then it pulls up a random species, and you have to try to, you know, do the operation thing. You know, Robert Picardo was one of the most memorable doctors because he, on Voyager, was a hologram. And so if you had either him or, like, he's doing the voice, but it's a uh, CG hologram of, of him from the show, and, like, he shows up and goes, hello, here's what you're going to have to do. Well, get to it. You know, like, and, yeah. and you just have to figure it out. Oh, and cool. maybe you've got a nurse with you who's an actor. But, like, just interactive, cool stuff like that if you wanted to yes. ramp it up from operation and make it like, <laughs> this is a hands-on experience and you can lose. You can really mess this up. You will get wet, and you may get soaked. <laughs> oh God! Sorry. Now I'm thinking of the whales in Star Trek IV. I don't think we, I don't think we do whales in captivity in a theme park where the movie about that was about setting them free. But I mean, yeah. something with a splash zone. I yeah. Don't know. And if we're near an ocean or something, you know, you could have like a big area of water that is contained where you know they can live comfortably. Um, wait, this is a bad idea, but we could even do like a stunt show where there's like, you know, um, a small area where the, the whales go around, but then at some point they escape captivity, you know, the, the crew comes in and I I guess you would just teleport them out, but I was, I was picturing you, them like breaking through fake glass and like pouring out into the ocean area. That's so contained, but it'd be kind of fun. (laughs) The thing about being able to beam them out is the transporter can always be malfunctioning. There's always something, Yes, there's a reason, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the transporter is a good, an easy way of um, explaining why you can't follow Picard after his stunt show performance to his theatrical performance. Oh, yeah, he was... You know, transported, ooh, teleported. Ooh, ooh, imagine a restaurant where you have to ste- step on transporter pads and, like, the special effect of it, how you would do it, I don't know. This is for That's the Imagineers to figure yeah. out. <laughs> but if you, step, if you step on the transporter pad, the light is blinding, and it really feels like you transported to an entirely different place mm-hmm. that is the restaurant when really they just – had some lights, moved the wall around, but, like, right. just something really, and... like, yeah, rotated it. Yeah. And obviously you'd be like, I know what happened, but, like, kids <laughs> might be, you know, delighted and, like, how did they do that? You know, that yes. kind of thing. Oh, that'd be really cool. Huh. That's a great idea. I wonder, I'm, I mean, it's not our job to figure out how to do that, but I think it could be right. possible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, how cool. And, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but coasters are one of the main draws of any park if it's not totally. Disney or Universal. Right. It's got to be I good think, theming or good coasters, yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, you could do coaster tropes that were just themed. Like, there's a there's this trope coaster where, like, it starts flat. Um, it goes from zero to, like, 100 miles an hour in, you know, three seconds. So you're just like, woo! You're, like, you know, <laughs> feeling all those Gs. But it could just uh-huh. be, like, emergency warp speed. Like, you know, we've got to get out of this wormhole. Yeah. Hit it. Warp warp 10. Or no, there's no warp 10 anymore. Warp 9. And you're just like, Bruh! and it's the same thing as the Superman ride or the whatever the one is called at Hershey Park. But it's just, um, you could even have it where at night, you know, you had the stars in such a way that it really looked like the light was doing that warp yes. speed or hyperdrive thing. And it would just feel for a second like we're on the ship doing the thing, you know? Yeah. Wait, that's totally doable. It could just be a big screen with stars, and then once the ignition is hit, they turn into stripes. Like, right. that would be amazing yeah. to see firsthand. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah, pretty cool. I love that. I think almost all the coasters should be indoors, too, so it feels like you're in outer space, you know, flying right. around. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's yeah, really cool. An outdoor, an outdoor coaster would be so much less... I mean, now I am now I want to challenge us to figure, to figure yeah, out right, an outdoor I know. coaster. <laughs> Um, Definitely the, like, hmm. shuttles to get two, you know, spaceships in outer space and a planet's surface in between spaceships. But, I mean, those would have to be some sort of coaster or people mover type thing. But as far as an actual coaster outdoors, I just don't know what the theme of that would be or, like, what the canon reason for having a track would be. There's this trope of, like, the mine train or the mini mine train. Mm -hmm. And it's like you could just, you know, Google, like, what is a mine or, like, for instance, the Klingon moon of uh, Praxis? Boy, have I been watching a lot of Star I'm Trek amazed. lately. <laughs> um, well, the Klingon moon of Praxis blows up in Star Trek Six, but before it does, I think it's something of a mining colony. 
And, you know, like, Klingon stuff, I think, is sometimes boring on the show, but, like, the darkness, the drabness, and the violence inherent to the warrior race of them can yeah. really ramp up the tension and atmosphere for a scary ride. So it could be the kind oh. of thing where it's, like, you start in the mine, and something goes wrong, and, you know, there's something chasing you, or for whatever reason, you've got to rock it out of there, and now, oh, we're on the mine thing, and, oh, we're going in between the different parts of the mine. Ah, we got to get out of here, you know, that kind of thing. And you could have, like, some Klingon commander that's audible from a speaker in the cars that's, like, telling you what's going on to ramp up the sort of meta drama of the moment, but it's just sure. a mine train Right, ride, it's a reason you know? for that. But I think most mines are considered indoors, though. Unless it goes to, like, a quarry, maybe? That's, it could be the same be track. Brilliant. Yeah, Thank and, you. like, have it be all a facade where, uh -huh. from the other side of the park, it could be whatever. It could, you know, just be covered in forest and, like, have a little area between. But when you're in it, it is like a quarry on the Klingon moon of Praxis, and it looks very dark, drab, you know, um, rocky, um, and... Uh, could be a, a fun reason to have an indoor slash outdoor mine train and you could like fly by a thing where you see you know like you see various things where the you know klingons fighting with batliths or just or like animatronics or something funny where totally. you just get a little taste of something going on as you fly by it and it again feels like that atmosphere that rewards you for getting it but you can also just enjoy the fact that you're on a mine cart you know mm -hmm. totally i <sighs> I really do like the Klingon culture. And, you know, they're misunderstood a lot of the time. But it'd be really interesting if, like, on the Kobayashi Maru, you can kind mm -hmm. of identify, you know, your your race or your culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you're, you feel like you're pretty good at Klingon, you can try to do the Kobayashi Maru in their language, <laughs> which oh would be goodness. an insane challenge. But it'd be really funny to, like, watch people struggle yeah. with, with that. Because, you know, as someone who has tried learning a new language and then going to the country right after that it is really hard to do um, oh yeah but it's really funny a lot of the time too you're like man i thought i knew what i was talking about and i have no way to say these words yeah when, um, but when be, i learned when i learned when i learned spanish and immersed myself i learned very quickly to say uh talk to me like please talk a little slower and then talk to me like i'm a toddler um, <laughs> just because it's kind of charming to say, but also, like, it really lets them know it what helps. level I am. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what theme park type things are normal for theme parks to have that we haven't touched on. Right. Um, I feel like we've got most of them. We could always add in more things like um, like a rock wall type experience because there, there's a lot of exploration of treacherous planet surfaces you can do laser right. tag with phaser i mean it's phaser oh, tag that phaser tag yes <laughs> oh my god phaser tag cool. that's a winner R done thank you Dunsky, wrap it print it um uh or with like, actors with know, face prosthetics and everything it could be pretty oh cool. yeah. yeah um i wonder about an equivalent to a Splash Mountain or Pirates of the Caribbean or yeah. Haunted Mansion. Like, what, you know, you're on rails, you're going through at the speed they want you to go through, Um, but what would it be? I mean, you could make it, like, scenes from Star Trek with animatronics, but to me, to make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more, like... um almost like if it was something educational if it was like a star trek sorry a starfleet academy training uh interactive experience where cool. it's telling you the history of various things but things keep going wrong um <laughs> like the the ride is the malfunction of this thing and mm -hmm. so that's where some of the comedy and interactive fun come from totally um and the people trying to give you the presentation, things keep going wrong. So you're seeing a little bit behind the curtain of what it would really be like while I going like through different scenes and, quote, educational experiences for the academy students. What just popped in my head was something I love about the old James Bond movies is when you see mm -hmm. Q and he shows you the new gadgets that are going to be in this movie, it usually goes wrong. And there's like at least some slapstick moments that go into those. Yeah those scenes yeah it could be something like that like here's this cool real technology that we're going to be using well real um but something yeah. goes wrong with it somebody you know slips on a banana peel or whatever equivalent 
Um, so there's something for the kids to laugh at, but then it's also like, wow, this is cool technology I'm learning about. I really want to do this for my career and, you know, enlist yeah. in Starfleet or whatever. At Disney World, there was like a special effects show. Mm -hmm. And they actually found a way to get people from the audience behind this mirror screen thing where it truly looked like they were being teleported away. It was a Star Trek themed thing. They borrowed it because um, it was like MGM Studios. I think Paramount partnered with them on this. But if cool. you had in the training thing some way that let's say that they have like invented this brand new teleporter ray gun. And so it does what a teleporter does or a transporter with a gun and then like the professor or whatever gets gets to an area where he's like now be careful with this because if you misfire it and then he fires it on himself <laughs> accidentally and like he's gone and then somebody else who was there was like I suppose I'll continue the presentation now you know like <laughs> that kind of thing and then later on you find out the professor's like on the ride with you he like got in the back car oh, and that's was like really you know funny. or whatever it is it's just like fun <laughs> For kids, it's not too serious. I think yeah. that would have to be a real um, interesting balance because you don't want the biggest fans to be like, they didn't take Star Trek seriously. But, like, a theme park cannot be too solemn and cerebral or it's right. no longer an amusement park. It's <laughs> just a museum a simulation. of rides. <laughs> right, right. Um, so to me, to have these fun things that are completely in canon mm -hmm. – uh, could just be such a fun way to bring it to life and get people into it. Yeah, I mean, there's totally zany, goofy mo moments from Star Trek. You know, if you go on YouTube and look up crazy Star Trek out of context, oh, you're going to yeah. be like, what the heck? Yeah, so absolutely. there are some goofballs that live in this universe, and they could be the professor at the Academy. Like, that's totally fine. Right. Um, I was thinking of other rides that might be kind of that Pirates of the Caribbean style. You could do one like... Mm -hmm. Uh, in within the Borg ship where like I don't know if you're taken as a prisoner or something and then you escape but like where there's some slow yeah. parts where you're taking in the scenery and like trying to understand or get a picture a glimpse of what it would be like to actually live on this ship but then you also get some action and you know someone's fighting over there like rescuing you and yeah so there's still some motion to it it's still considered like a roller coaster but it's also has some slower parts where uh, you get to take in the ambiance a little bit a Borg, a Borg cube ride on rails could be so cool because you always see it in the special effects in the show. Yeah. And it changes, you know, by the time you're on Voyager, it's all very green and purple. But to have, like, the illusion of a true working, all the lights, all the things, you see goop going through the tubes, you see that <laughs> yeah. they're, like, at their charging stations and maybe one wakes up and starts walking That'd towards cool. you and they're like, go, go, go. You know, we're undercover. Um, oh, that could be so spooky and cool. That could honestly be. It could be a scary attraction too. Yeah. Yeah. There's some horror um, moments for sure in the series. Like, right. And yeah. it's, yeah, you have somebody who's like, fire your phasers and you fire your phasers on the thing, but it's like, they're adapting. Let's yes. go. You know, they, it's not <laughs> working anymore. That kind of thing. That's really cool. Or yeah, with the Borg, like, in one of the video games, I don't remember what which one, but there's a part where you're like, it's the first person shooter one, and you're shooting the mm -hmm. Borg, but they're invulnerable. You can't hurt them until you go like destroy these little frequency things, and then you right. can shoot them. But like that's a really scary moment in a first person shooter where an enemy is shooting you and you can't shoot them. It's like what what? Right. It's right. it's a, it could be very it's a cool very scary. Moment. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I have a weapon, but it's not effective. Yeah. Against you. That's really cool. But there's all kinds of horror type you know, escape room sort of experiences you could do. Like it could even be mm -hmm. where you have a phaser and you have like some tools that you would actually have if you were on Starfleet and you need to figure out a way of escaping this area or, or, you know, getting away from the monster. They even have an escape room in real life where there's a zombie chained up in the corner, like a human pr pretending to be a zombie because zombies don't exist, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, right. But then every 10 minutes, the chain that they're connected to the wall with gets longer so by the end of the hour, they can actually grab you. Like right. that sort of experience would be really cool. Like where the timer is connected to something physical in a room that is legitimately scary. Like totally. I love that. Awesome, man. Well, I feel like this has gone some really cool places. Um, are there any moments from, I mean, anything in Star Trek really that you feel like we would be really bummed out if we didn't do? Well, I mean, I, I'm trying to find as much as I've been steeped in adapting the con story. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm having a hard time, like, it could simply be that part of the stunt show um, is recreating what I think is one of the most tense and fun moments from the entire franchise, which is where Khan has stolen a Starfleet ship and is coming up to the Enterprise, and they don't know what's wrong because this is a Starfleet ship. So the people on the Enterprise are like, uh, what's going on here? And then Khan and the Reliant just completely decimates the Enterprise, turns on the screen and goes, hey, I just wanted you to know who it was that killed you. And when I come about, I'm going to do that. And Kirk's like got 60 seconds with a ship full of cadets and um, he's got to outsmart Khan. And then when he does, and they do it as a team, Savick, Spock, everybody, it's one of the most like, I don't know that you cheer in the audience, but it like, at, like at it. the movie. But yeah. I feel like if you had some way to make it a little bit interactive, I mean, you don't want it to be too patronizing to the audience. But if Kirk's like, "What do I do?" You know, like, "Tell uh -huh. me what to do." <laughs> I, I, what do you think? I, well, that won't work because of this. But and like a really good improv actor that could be like, "Well, you see, the photonic phaser duotronic booby bops. Well, won't do that. So you, you give me an idea, like or whatever it is." Yeah, it could even be a comedy like experience, but there's also the kind of real, you know, in in canon it's real, but you just yeah. have a really funny actor, you know, trying to lead you. That right. sounds great. Right. That sounds really cool. Could be fun. Wow. And you could do all sorts of experiences like that, and you know, change them out once a year or whatever. Change out the simulation of who's the bad guy and what are the solutions of how we could win this. So you can't. Totally. You, if if you're a, a hardcore fan, you want to go every month. You're not going to yeah. know the solution where you can just yell out the correct answer from the back of the class and, oh, well, right. we didn't get to mess with anyone. You know, no one guessed right. the wrong thing that time. There's so much to pull from as far as, you know, new threats, new um, people helping out, new crew members. There's a lot that can be evolving from year to year as well, even within the same infrastructure. Yeah. It's awesome. And, and, and to put a bow on it, I think it would be silly not to have a museum of props, costumes, models anything they could get their hands on or pull out of the warehouse, like even sets from the movies or here's the 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 big eel worm, here's the giant Chekhov ear from Wrath of Khan or, you know, the Borg suit Picard war, whatever. Like that would just Those be, would all be so cool. such a cool thing to just walk through as a little exhibit, read the plaques, you know. Mm -hmm. um, even like a, 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 you know, if there was a typewritten letter that Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, wrote, um, that like just survived in the archives and just to see it in a frame like cool cool stuff like that for the big fans I would love that that'd be amazing wow Brent Black thank you for joining us man that was amazing I want to go here so bad like me too what would we call <laughs> it cool would part. it be would it be Star Trek Galaxy uh, that's a great name I like that yeah well, I mean that's a super go. easy answer boom first try Dunsky, I like that because Disney Better World, than just Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. Galaxy's yeah. perfect. Star Trek Galaxy. I like that a lot. Dude, Man. wow. That was awesome. <laughs> um, for people who have heard this podcast and now want to find more of you, where can they go to, to check you out? Well, um, I imagine those who have stuck with us are Trekkies, uh, I would by and large. So <laughs> my my current show I'm writing is called Con Three Exclamation Points, the musical. Uh, and I am semi-secretly developing it, but you can get more information and follow the progress of the show's development at twitter.com slash UASTPM. That stands for Unauthorized Star Trek Parody Musical, but it's at UASTPM. I'm also the uh, designer and co-creator of a comedy party game uh, that is on consoles and PC and Mac. It's called Use Your Words. You can find more about that at Use Your Words. Dot LOL, and I'm the co-host of a news and politics podcast with a comedy spin called Trends Like These, which you can find on all fine purveyors of podcasts. Perfect. You can find Amusement Sparks on social media as Amusement Sparks. Uh, thanks for listening or watching, and thank you for being here. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. That was so much fun. Hopefully we can work together again someday. Yeah, live long and prosper. <laughs> Perfect. Wow, that was such a good thing to go out on.